afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again this afternoon on session two of the 2020 National Hydraulic Engineering Conference. It's Victoria Beale with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm very pleased to have with me a number of my colleagues from across the country who will be presenting for you today. If you didn't join us this morning, um, please note that we do have a question box that's available in the GoToWebinar panel, and we would ask that you please place all of your questions there. If you didn't do so this morning or weren't with us at that time and want to just drop a quick hi or hello so you know that you found it, that would be great. Also in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel, we've provided the handouts for this afternoon's presentations. So with that, those are all of the housekeeping items I have. Um, we'll go ahead and turn things over to Brad McManus. Thank you, Victor. <clears throat> Thank you Victoria. Again, uh, Good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, right now we're going to start session two, which is Aquatic Organisms Passage. And the first up will be the environment versus climate, the push me, pull you, pull you of culvert sizing by Charlie Hebson. Then we'll get into monitoring protocol for us assessing aquatic organism passage at water crossings. And then the development and application of a hybrid approach to estimate bank full width. Uh, <clears throat> And so, uh, getting into the, our first presenter with uh, Charlie Hebson. He's the uh, chief hydrologist for the Maine Department of Transportation. Uh, Charlie is the manager of the Water Surface Resource Division in the Maine DOT Environmental Office. He holds a PhD in hydrology, water resources, civil engineering from Princeton University, and an SEB civil engineering from Brown University. His responsibilities include hydrology and hydraulics for transportation design. A special emphasis uh, with a special emphasis on field evaluations and design for fish passage as well as projects with significant water related environmental issues. Charlie also provides technical support to ongoing policy development related to hydraulic design and fish passage as well as development of technical guidance materials for hydrology, hydraulics, and fish passage design. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Charlie, and that's a pretty impressive uh, bio, Charlie. Um, thank you, Brad. For the, uh, this presentation, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, this talk could just as well have been uh, put in the morning session. It's about culverts, small things. Um, you know, we're all used to the uh, traditional approaches to sizing these things, uh, but more recently now we have to deal with environmental concerns, fish passage, and climate. Um, the thing with culverts, there's just so darn many of them. Uh, that's, the, that's the challenge. So several years ago, Federal Highway released an order related to resilience. And uh, goes on a lot of verbiage there, basically encouraging DOTs to consider resilience. And there's one word that stands out for me in there, as regards culverts is withstand these extreme events. Because basically when we design them, we're designing them to withstand well-defined extreme events. And we're hoping that the ones that are on the ground can also withstand those events. Regarding resilience then, I looked at three questions here today. Uh, the first one is how resilient is our culvert standard? Does that even have to change or is it good enough? Or is it better than uh, the next one is how resilient is our culvert population, all those culverts in the ground right now. Then the third one, you know, more recently we're designing uh, significant numbers of culverts for aquatic organism passage. And where do they stand with regards to resilience? All these water crossings at, at Maine DOT, we have three large categories. We have bridges, uh, two subcategories in there, minor spans, major spans. These are things 10 to 20 feet minor spans, greater than 20 feet bridges. Um, structurally, a lot of these things are culverts, buried structures. And at least for today's purposes, I'm, I'm just looking at uh, smaller culverts. Uh, I'm going to assume that the bridges, for the time being, have sufficient capacity and can pass fish. We have this uh, category of large culverts between five and 10 feet, relatively fewer 
large culverts, only about 2,000. Um, then we get to cross culverts, those under five feet, 36,000, give or take. It's a lot. Now, a lot of those are just stormwater conveyances, but um, I don't know, maybe a fifth or more carry real streams. And uh, those are the ones I'm especially concerned about today. Traditionally, these, these cross culverts, the 36,000 cross culverts, they uh, have been viewed as small, simple, cheap, managed, replaced out of the five maintenance regions. Uh, traditionally, they're not designed in any way. Very often, they're just replaced in kind if, uh, the, if there's no known problems with them. Um, that's changing just because it's so easy to do simple hydrology, hydraulics, and that's all that's warranted for these things. Um, we are designing them now, generally. Fish passage has been a big game changer, though, because uh, it doesn't matter how small that stream is. If it's uh, a nice stream with brook trout in it, we're going to have to build it for fish passage. Um, and as we, as I've said, it's it's pretty easy to do some basic hydrology and hydraulics on these that you know, 30 years ago, maybe when they went in, wasn't ju just wasn't possible. This is a snapshot of our culvert population. Um, we have a total of about 15 or 16,000 cross culverts, 24 inches to 60 inches. And kind of arbitrary, but I'm assuming that the two feet and up range is, might be carrying real streams. And then those ones less than 18 inches, I'm assuming are just stormwater conveyances. Again, Right now, I won't worry too much about those. So, you know, it's an obvious question, maybe a dumb question. Why is potential upsizing a problem? Well, bigger pipes cost more. The structure itself, maybe the excavation. Um, but, but going from a two foot to a three or four foot pipe, that's not a big deal. And, and nobody's going to lose any sleep over that. But if we're faced with aquatic organism passage, if you're going from a two or three footer to an eight or 10 or 12 foot box culvert, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. They cost a lot. The budgets that they have devoted to these programs, um, they're just set somewhat arbitrarily year to year, depending on how much we have. Um, well, we, we just can't do very many of them. And so trying to assess the whole system of 36,000 culverts, can we get a picture of what we're in for? And that means looking at hydrology, hydraulics, habitat, and based on computer tools, GIS tools that we didn't have 10 years ago, we can look at this. We can get a good picture, big picture view of, of what we might have to deal with. So the first question, how resilient is the main DOT culvert standard? Um, again, big picture, 30,000 foot view, and I'm going to rely on some simple hydrology and hydraulics to, to get to what I think is a, at least an acceptable understanding of where we are. So our culvert standard, the hydraulic standard, that is, it's a two-headed monster. Um, you know, until a few years ago, we had one standard for cross culverts and large culverts. Now, uh, slightly different. Okay, and I have an asterisk next to two-headed because. There's a third head lurking in the background, not a hydraulic standard, but our environmental standard. It says we may have to size a culvert according to how wide the stream is. That's bank full width. That's a probably heard that lingo. Um, so that's the third standard, bank full width standard. Right now, I'll just look at the hydraulic standard, the traditional approach to size these. So regardless of whether it's cross culvert or large culvert, there's two parts to that standard. There's the hydraulic part, that submergence ratio at the inlet. And the cross culvert, we let it submerge up to HW over D at 1.5, 50% okay, higher than the, the rise of the culvert at maximum. And here's the hydrology piece, the design flow at the 50 year flow. Large culverts, on the other hand, we don't let the water get as deep, it can only just flow full ratio equal one at most, at a bigger design flow, 100 year flow. So two things in going from a cross culvert standard to large culvert, 
push us to a larger culvert for the same watershed. Okay, tighter hydraulic standard, bigger design flow. It's just a quick illustration of, of that, that inlet hydraulic condition that we allow. Here's the large culvert. The water can go just as deep as the rise of the culvert at Q100. Cross culvert standard can go deeper by 50% at a lower flow. We start out by doing a calculation as if it's a cross culvert. And if the resulting pipe diameter is greater than five feet, then we resize it as a large culvert. So to look at a standard and, and get in a, a feel for how it performs system wide, we have to keep it simple. So we have simple hydrology in Maine, partly because we don't have much of a gauging network. Uh, we have one set of statewide equations. And for most of the work I'm going to talk about today, I'm using a very simple area only equation. If you can calculate the area of the watershed, you can calculate a design flow. Simple power law, right? Comes right out of USGS regression studies for us. Additional equation, if we have to switch over to the environmental sizing, again, power law for area to get estimate bankable width. Hydraulics is real simple. We assume a round corrugated metal pipe under inlet control. Uh, if you're looking at individual culverts, of course, we're going to use stream stats to get the area. And if we need the full equation, the wetlands. So here's the regression equality, uh, equation, just as you'd expect, straight lines. Um, what I'm going to point out here, and I only look up to about five or six square miles because that's the maximum watershed size where we might use a culvert. Going from 25 to 50 year flow, it's about a 20% bump. And again, 50 year flow to 100, another 20% bump. People are impressed when we say, oh, we changed our standard. We're going to design for the 100 year flow now. It used to be 50 year. They, of course, they think we're doubling that design flow. We're not. It's about a 20% bump in the, in the magnitude of the design flow. And this is a picture again of that, those flow ratios. In fact, they, they vary a little bit, but over this watershed range, 0.1 to 5 square miles, you're safe to say, oh, they're about a 20% bump going from these uh, alternative candidate design flow return periods. What about future flows? So here's the, the, the resilience piece now. Um, as you've heard, we, we don't have uh, reliable, generally accepted methods for projecting future design flows. Um, lots of people working on it. Um, furthermore, in Maine, at least in northern New England, they haven't even found strong evidence for increases uh, in the record, increases in these big design flows, the, the high return period, the low AEP, 50, 100 years. It just doesn't show up in the record yet. So I'm comfortable for this work, assuming a 20% increase in these design flows. And that's roughly in line with what we were seeing in uh, the work from Pennsylvania, for instance, this morning. Um, and that's based on some participation work by Arc de Gatano for New York DOT. And I just, simplistic, I think it's reasonable for this kind of uh, effort. I think it's conservative too. Here's this, uh, the hydraulics piece, real simple, dimensionless performance curve. Um, what I want to point out here is, is that here's the hydraulic standard, ratio of 1 or 1 1.5. That has a corresponding dimensionless discharge value. So for these round pipes, you can express the standard, the hydraulic standard, either as a ratio or dimensionless discharge. And from that, for a given return period, you can calculate the diameter as a simple power function of flow. Skip the development of this equation. The key thing is, is that we can come up with a simple power law equation relating diameter to watershed area. It's as simple as that. Simple, simple, simple. So the effects, the relative effects in this standard of flow and submergence ratios. If you look at this ratio of a large culvert diameter to cross culvert, you can boil it down to two factors multiplied together. This first one, roughly 1.2, is due to the submergence ratio. Second one is due to the hydrology. So hydraulics effect times hydrology effects. About 20% of that increase in uh, 
culvert size is due to the uh, more stringent hydraulic standard at the inlet. Only 7% is due to the increase in the uh, design flow, at least for the main hydrology. Multiply them together, you get a total of about a 25% increase in culvert size. So if the same watershed, if you go from cross culvert to a large culvert, you increase the size by 25%. So that's an upsizing, not insignificant, but manageable. Here you see uh, the size as a function of watershed area. Get to a certain point in the cross culvert standard, and then we jump. Manageable, that's that 25% jump. But the third line here, cross culvert size, large culvert size, this is our bank full width size. Big jump. Let's say we had a cross culvert in the ground and we now have to provide fish passage. That's a major substantial increase in structure size. And it comes at significant cost. Same picture again uh, with a little more information on it, trying to bring in the resilience piece. So the black line, the stair step, those are the available culvert sizes. You know, you might calculate a, a size of 3.3. Uh, well, you have to pick something off the shelf. So these are the available sizes that capture the calculated values. The blue line, cross culverts. The red line for large culverts. Now here, the green and the yellow line, I've slapped on the 20% increase in flows for climate change. Let's see how resilient the standard is. Based on this, I'm going to say that the standard is pretty resilient for the kind of hydrology we face in Maine. Okay, the calculated size for increased flow is still pretty darn close to uh, the available pipe size we would have put in initially in a, in a replacement. And then here is bank full with, with sizing again. Lots of resilience. So based on this, I would say that our hydraulic standard has sufficient resilience. And then if we're replacing with uh, fish passage culverts, more than enough. Here's one last look at bank full width sizing. Um, the green line is the 100 year flow. The red line is the box culvert flow capacity. I'm looking at box culverts. You can see that the flow capacity of the box culvert at a submergence ratio of one, an open rise of six feet, and we find we need them that tall just to build them effectively. Lots of excess capacity in here. See the box can carry this. And here's the 100 year flow. And it's only when you get up to the very high range of box culverts, we rarely build them this big, that they even approach one another. So, resilience with our current standard, current standard, sufficient resilience against future events, assuming 20% increase. And even the bank full width sizing gives us lots more. Now, quick look at what we have in the ground. Um, 36,000 culverts statewide. I'm just going to look at our region five. It's the northern part of the state, way up there. Here's Mount Katahdin, our iconic mountain. Beautiful up there. And mind you, I just want to mention that this is all predicated on the undeveloped watersheds. We are blessed with, at least at Maine DOT, we're dealing mostly with undeveloped watersheds. No urban problems to speak of or excess impervious. It does make life simple. Uh, you know, we have about 6,000 total cross culverts there, uh, maybe 3,500 of them, 24 inches and bigger. It was this, here we're looking at actual culverts. It was a huge GIS exercise, quite tedious, conceptually simple, but doing it's another story. Um, we did lots of snapping, snapping culvert locations to the USGS stream network and stream stats, and then we would run batches of culverts through stream stats. Um, that's a whole other story. Um, but once we do that, well, the hydrology and hydraulics, same simple approach as I described previously. I'm going to look at just one size category now. These are the culverts, remember, up to uh, not including five feet. I'm going to look at the subset from two feet up to three and a half feet, 24 inches to 42 inches. So if I just look at taking these culverts, there's about 1,100 of them. And now I resize them by our hydraulic standard. These culverts in here, they're adequately sized. These out here, we would have to upsize. At 1100, we're upsizing 
you know, 150 to 200 culverts. And most of them were upsizing maybe up to four to five and a half or six feet. That's manageable. A handful get a bit larger, but all in all, I would say, if all you have to do is size hydraulically, we're in good shape for resilience and good shape in terms of planning for future expenditures. We can manage these sorts of things. But if we have to upsize this range of culverts for bank full, for fish passage, it's a whole different story. 1,100, 600 of them have to be upsized. And we get something on the order of 150, maybe even 200 culverts that have to be significantly upsized up into the 10, 12, 14 foot range, starting down there in the three foot range. That's a problem. That is a real problem. And it challenges our budgets every year. Now, just before I wrap this up, just because something comes out as undersized in these calculations doesn't mean it fails, right? Um, I'm convinced that remarkably few of our culverts fail because they aren't big enough. Usually it's because of other reasons. They're clogging, uh, some structural failure, maybe slope failures, but capacity usually isn't the problem. And then if you're looking at pipes that were designed according to some standard in the past, even fewer of those are going to fail by capacity. So I, I get to the point now where I think our cross culvert population, even now, is largely resilient without even designing for resilience. Um, this high hydraulic standard is very strong. And uh, we can manage resilience on the hydraulic side. What remains to be done? More GIS work. I'd like to finish up the other regions, look at the large culvert population, maybe assess overtopping. And we have a great database, and that's key to doing this work, is having the database. And then as climate, better climate methods come along, maybe look at climate sensitivity again. Um, so to conclude, say the hydraulic standard is a good one. That, that's good news. Um, the existing culverts, we can manage for resilience. I'm confident of that. The bank full width sizing, that's the challenge. And I think you'll hear that from every state that has to deal with fish passage in a major wet. Um, and we have no choice on that, but we just have to figure out a way to get it done. That's it. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Charlie. It's very informative. Uh, yeah, we're all dealing with bank fully. A lot of us are. I know you know that I am. Um, I do have one question that came in. It says, I saw that you have regression equations listed for drainage areas above 0 0.1 square miles. Does Maine not use rational method analysis? And where did your regression equations come from? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> very good question. I have to keep things simple to do this sort of work. Realistically, for those watersheds um, below half a square mile, I'm probably using the rational method. Maybe I do both calculations and then I use some judgment. Um, so yes, we do use rational method, but probably those watersheds down near, uh, you know, quarter of a square mile or, or lower, I, I just have this feeling that's, that's less of an issue for us anyway. But um, the regression equations, USGS, every so often we have them update the equations. Uh, 20 years ago they did them, and they've just completed the 20-year update. And that's a key part of, of doing this sort of work, and everyone will tell you, you want to keep your equations updated, up to date. And I, I'm convinced that if you do that, there's, there's less, I don't say you don't worry, but you don't have to worry quite as much about projecting flows as well. Um, and based on what we're seeing for this 20 year update, I won't be around, but I'd be inclined to think that we might be able to go to a 25 year period for updating equations. Thank you. Um, has uh, Maine done anything with uh, NR, NRCS method? The SES, I guess, SES, NRCS, or the TR55? Uh, people always smile when I tell them this. Um, we, Rarely, if ever, do any kind of rainfall runoff modeling, um, SCS, TR20 type work. The closest we get to that is rational method calculations for the smallest watershed. But because 
the vast majority of our watersheds are undeveloped. Um, we feel that we get better results uh, using regression in terms of understanding uh, statistics of results, things like that. All right, thank you, Charlie. I think that's all the quest questions I have, unless anybody wants to ask any right now. Brad, I sent you one more that just came in. Yes, thank you. Uh, how is it determined which structures have to be designed for aquatic organism passage? <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Um, our situation is a little unique uh, because about a third of the state is mapped uh, for endangered species, Atlantic salmon. And so we've spent a lot of time over the years identifying regions of the state where we know uh, automatically if we're going to replace a, a culvert in a particular watershed, it has to be designed for aquatic organisms. And so, um, you know, no question, we just for those, those we can plan for, in fact, and those get 1.2 bank full with stream beds in them. Uh, we have a, a pretty good staff of biologists. In addition to the Atlantic salmon watersheds, we have brook trout throughout the state, and um, they go out and work with the state resource agencies to determine which streams have to get AOP. Yeah. So we're set up for it. It's um, We've been doing this a long time now. It's not the engineers making that determination, trust me. Okay, a few more questions have come in. Uh, do you count dead zones when, I think this means to be stream entering CBC from cross-section areas? It was typed in pretty quick. Wow. Um, I am assuming they're talking about dead zones for hydraulic flow, maybe? Um, that's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, uh, this, you have to, um, this is such a simplistic analysis that I've done. Um, I think that kind of question there that's been posed, you might consider on an individual project design. But remember, I'm looking at a, in this talk, I was looking at a standard that applies to all 36,000 culverts. And then I was looking at the population of 36,000 culverts. And so the hydraulics is really simplistic. It's just that dimensionless performance curve. So I don't, the answer is no. All right. Uh, one other question was, where did bankful width come from? And I, excuse me, where did the bankful width equation come from? Okay, that uh, is also developed by the USG. Well, I, uh, there's one version of that that was developed by the USGS that's officially published. And then the second version, de also developed by USGS with a much larger data set that is uh, kind of semi published and that the resource agencies, the regulators insisted that we use. Um, USGS basically, but lots of people have collected the bankful width measurements that go into um, that equation. That I think that equation could stand some improving, uh, but that's what we use. Now, I will say this, that's what I use for this systematic, system-wide analysis. When we're designing individual projects, we always go out and measure a bank full width. And unless we have reason to believe that we can't get a good measurement, um, we always use the measured value and we don't design with the calculated value. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, let's see. One of the next questions was, I'm a bit perplexed by the statement that records do not indicate an increase in rainfall, large storm events. And they're asking, didn't the, Nash, didn't the fourth national climate assessment indicate that such events were increasing in severity by large measures in the Northeast? So it looks like they're uh, asking about them. Yeah, this is another great question. And it's it's one of my frustrations that it's, uh, you get a lot of different answers to this question. And what I am going on in my statement is what uh, Glenn Hodgkins and his coworkers have come up with for the Northeast. Um, and I won't say, it, it, it's just the, the 
the evidence is, uh, let's say, indeterminate at this point. Um, I, I think for the, uh, the more frequent events, the two-year, the five-year events, probably you can find uh, re real strong evidence that those are increasing. It's when you get up to our design events, the 50 year, the 100 year, it's just a lot harder statistically. It's a much more difficult question. And try as they might, they don't find the evidence. There's not a lot of, there's not strong evidence that they're increasing and that it's necessarily something you want to go and design with. So that said, um, you know, I could just as easily assume we're not going to project at all, but um, I did look at a 20% increase. Um, broad brush assumption of what might be a reasonable increase. Now, the, the, the jury, I, people do different studies. They come up with different results and different recommendations. Um, but for, for a lot of our watersheds in New England, the, uh, the largest events on record are still the, uh, the hurricanes from the 1930s. Um, so it's, it's a tough question. Uh, people are still working on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we're out of time for the questions. Um, there were a few more, and I think we'll put those uh, put those to the to the presenter uh, to be answered. All right. Uh, thank you, Charlie. It's very good presentation. Appreciate that. Appreciate the answer for all those questions. Uh, right now, I'd like to mention that the uh, lab tour that we mentioned earlier that is postponed will be on tomorrow at twelve forty five p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'm not sure what that is, GMT time, but anyway, um, now we're going to have the the second part of this second session. It's going to be the monitoring protocol for assessing aquatic organism passage at water crossings. This will be uh, done, led by Justin Lennon and Casey Kramer. And uh, Justin is a uh, WSP's national practice area leader for hydraulic structures and flood control. He specializes in the area of river mechanics, fluvial geomorphology, hydraulics and hydrology, and fish passage. And then our next presenter, Casey Kramer, his co-presenter, Casey Kramer, excuse me, Prince is principal of Natural Resources, uh, LLC. <clears throat> and Casey is recognized expert in the fields of hydrology and hydraulics, scour river engineering, sediment transport, and fish passage, while specializing in the hydraulic design of transportation facilities. He's been involved with over 400 water and transportation projects and has a thorough understanding of project delivery within a Department of Transportation. Casey was formerly with this, formerly the State Highway Hydraulic Engineer for Washington State Department of Transportation, WSDOT, or De yeah, uh, Washington State DOT <coughs> headquarters, hydraulics and stormwater offices, where he also served as a member of the AASHTO uh, Technical Committee on hydrology and hydraulics. He has assisted in the development of various national design guidelines, policies, and procedures for the design of construction and hydraulic <clears throat> scour projects. Casey has extensive experience assessing, characterizing, and prioritizing, scoping, designing, permitting, and constructing transportation hydraulic projects. He holds a master's of science degree in river engineering from Iowa Institute of Hydraulic Research and the University of Iowa and a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Washington State University. All right, so with all that, I'd like to turn it over to Justin Lennon, and then after that, we'll be uh, Casey Kramer on the same presentation. Thank you, guys. Okay, thanks, Brad. I guess uh, next time I'm presenting with Casey, I'll need to remember to send in a longer bio. I think uh, I've got to stand up yeah. to that. <laughs> uh, all right, right well, sure. thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks everyone for, for joining in with this talk. Uh, we're gonna be presenting on a project that we've been working on for the last two years with the uh, Western Federal Lands Highway Division, looking at the effectiveness of these AOP culverts that we've been building across the country. So I wanted to start off by recognizing our project team. So besides Casey and ourself, I also have uh, Kate Clavon from my staff at WSP is uh, playing a big role in continuing on with this project and with uh, Western Federal Lands. Steve Morrow is our project manager, and then we also have Sven Leon and Jim Niehorn, who I expect are probably both on the conference call today, uh, that are our tech technical experts with Western Federal that are participating in the effort. 
We also have an external technical committee that's been helping guide us along the way. They've been our sounding board as we come up with all these different off the wall ideas on how we wanna go about this monitoring. They keep us grounded and provide a lot of great expert advice and uh, critiques as we've been moving along with this. I suspect many of our technical committee are on the call today. So we extend a big thank you to all their help and the time they've spent with us as we've been going through this project. So starting off, why, why are we doing this? Um, we know across the country that uh, AOP culverts are starting to become a very substantial market, uh, a big market driver. There's billions that are being spent, projected to be spent on fish passage AOP culverts. And then on top of that, we've got a number of varied design approaches that go into how we design these. If you look at HEC 26, you've got Washington State's version of stream simulation. You've got the forest, uh, the forest Service's version of stream simulation. You've got various different types of bankful based metrics such as Charlie had been presenting earlier. What we've been finding as we look at these is that really the selection of this design approach can really be as important as any other decisions that are made during the design of an AOP culvert. And there's just not a lot of information out there on when to use what approach, what may be more appropriate, what may be more effective. So we, this, this monitoring program started with this desire to put together a robust data set to inform us on how these different approaches were performing and what sort of effectiveness we were actually seeing with these AOP structures. Hey, Justin, you went on mute for some reason, I think. Yeah. It... Oh, there, there we, we go. go. Much better. Interesting. Interesting. Don't know how I did that. Um, so hopefully you caught that last slide. But uh, <laughs> um, so what we're doing under this project is putting together a standardized monitoring protocol. We want to be able to go out to site across the country in various different geomorphic settings, various flow settings, and collect our data on the effectiveness of these, of these AOP crossings. We want to have, you know, we want this data set to be applicable to all types of fish, spe fish species, all types of AO species uh, at all life stages. Um, and our, our end goal here is really to start to facilitate future research. Right now, as I go into this data set, I'm going to show you a lot of geomorphic based data collection points that we're looking at. We want to be able to mesh this later on with biological data to really guide this effectiveness criteria. Our current structure, um, this protocol has been proposed as a multi-stage protocol. We start off with an as-built uh, processing desktop exercise. We have developed the stage one geomorphic data exercise, which I'm going to walk through today. We have future steps in place looking at a stage two and a stage three assessment that are going to build in biologic data, hydraulic data, uh, as well as possibly more detailed geomorphic data. As we go out into the field and do this, we do feel that these inspections are best done by a multidisciplinary team that's going to include engineers, fisheries biologists, uh, or, or some other appropriately trained staff. Currently, we are looking at very simplified procedures for the field. We're not asking surveyors to go out with total stations. We're doing this all in a fairly rapid assessment method using just clinometers, uh, fiberglass rods, measuring tapes, cameras, and, uh, and our um, paper-based form. So if anyone is, is interested, we have loaded the form up to the handout pod. You'll see a uh, Western Federal Lands Fish Passage Monitoring uh, Protocol form on there. You could take a look at the data fields we've been looking at for this data collection. So the stage one geomorphic assessment. What we've done, the details of how we've broken this down, is we have inspectors looking at individual reaches downstream of the AO structure, internal to the structure, and then upstream. The method is really targeted at the collection of comparative data. We want to take a look at how conditions in the natural system downstream versus internal versus upstream compare. We're really prioritizing consistency in this collection over accuracy. We want to know how 
how things compare. Uh, some of our individual data points are listed here, but I'm gonna walk through these one at a time. So our first data collection point is the evidence of channel alterations. So, you know, we're putting together this data set. We want it to facilitate future research. We feel that this is an important contextual point for researchers to understand when they look at this data, whether the reach upstream or downstream is indeed believed to be a natural stream reach or whether we know that it was modified. You know, we have two example photos here. Uh, this, the top one was uh, clearly a restored stream reach. It was a very nice stream. However, as we walked into the downstream reach below here, we saw that uh, things were much steeper. We had a lot of boulder clusters, steeper drops in this. So we know that the habitat within this stream maybe wasn't as adapted to this restored reach, even though it functions very well. Uh, and the, then the lower photo, you can see through our legs there, you see the riprap placed along the stream bank. Uh, we also realized that this, this channel bed here was hardened and modified. So we really wanted to start off by setting this context of was this channel modified so that we understand the data and the implications of the data later on as we're doing our comparisons. Next data collection point is focused on channel characteristics. First, we document our geomorphic channel type. Are we in a riffle pool system? Are we in a step pool system? Are we in you know, a flowing wetland plain bed system? Documentation of channel slope and how is channel slope changing? Do we have a relatively steep slope upstream of our structure? How does the slope inside the structure compare? Uh, same with cross sections. We collect flow, we collect width and depth characteristics for the cross sections, both at the flow condition at the time of inspection, as well as our active channel, uh, similar to the bank full condition. And how do these things compare internal, upstream, and downstream? And then the last one's the, the characteristic bed material. We have the inspectors visualizing the D50 and the D100 in the site. One of the things that came out of our uh, collaboration with our external technical, technical committee was the suggestion from the fisheries biologists that fish may exhibit behavioral issues if we see wide shifts in the bed material type, the substrate type, as you go from the natural system into the AOP. If you have a significant coarsening of the bed material, fish may just not want to go in there. We don't know, you know, we don't have the data right now to make a call on how significant that is, but again, we wanted to collect that data to help inform things as we continue on with the process. Another feature is documentation of depositional features. As we started into this process, we talked about wanting to have a feel for bed load transport stability through these structures. Were structures aggrading, degrading? Were they stable threshold transport through? What we found out pretty quick was when we got three or four different fluvial geomorphologists out of the site, we didn't always agree on where things sat. You know, we could be standing there looking at the exact same stream. One of us would have the the opinion that the system was stable, another would have the opinion that the system was degrading. So we ended up simplifying this, and now we just ask the inspectors to document the types of depositional features out there, along with characteristics of this sediment that could be used later in our research to inform how we think things are performing on a sediment transport side. And then the last one that we collect uh, across all of them is this, uh, this concept that we call our potential AO limiting features. So what we're really looking for here are these like higher gradient features that we think fish or other aquatic organisms may have difficulty passing at different flow stages. We are not asking our inspectors to make a judgment call in the field as to whether something is a blockage or not. We just wanna start documenting these and we wanna document them upstream, downstream, and internal to the culvert. And again, this is a point that we can compare. We know if, you know, if a steep drop is fairly natural to a system, the species that live in there are gonna be adapted to that. And there's gonna be a certain amount of tolerance internal to the system. So we did not wanna just draw a hard cut off like we see in some of the blockage procedures, you know, just saying if we have a six inch drop document it, that's a blockage and there. We wanted a little more nuanced approach. So what we ask our inspectors to do is to basically document any feature within the assessment reach that we think could have the potential to be a blockage. And they can document as many as they want or as, you know, as few as one or two of them along the way. 
And then as we move inside the culvert, we do have a couple of special features we look to document inside the constructed AOPs, and these are really unique to the, to the construction process. The first is um, interior banks. Do we have a design methodology that required the construction of interior banks? What are their characteristics? How tall are they? How wide are they? How stable? What sort of material are they constructed out of? Casey's gonna talk a little bit more in a few minutes about some of the lessons we've learned from the interior banks. Another are large roughness features. Do we have boulder clusters in there? How frequent are they? How, is, how are they spaced? What does their stability look like? And then in a more general sense, are we seeing scour inside the structure and how is the stability of the bed looking? Uh, one of the things we've seen early on with some of the smaller size culverts, we do see evidence of loss of fines in the bed and that's where you start to see just a general coarser substrate such as we have in that top right hand photo there where much of the fines were washed out of that culvert. The bed was still very stable because of the large rocks that were in the mixture, but a lot of the fines were lost there and back to this thought that uh, you know changing coarseness may cause behavioral issues, we could see that there. Uh, and then additionally scour, you know, do we have scour holes opening up upstream, downstream of culverts. Uh, one of the things that we have started to see with the um, AOP design culverts is that uh, inlet scour is much more common so far than outlet scour due to the size of these structures. So this was an instance here where we did have some scour along the uh, right strip footer for this, uh, this arch CMP culvert. And then the last data collection point we're doing is we're also doing internal cross sections within the culvert. Uh, we're doing these with the hope that we'll be able to get back out to these structures several times over the next couple of years. And we can start to put together a time series of what the cross section looks like through these culverts. How stable are the materials? How are they evolving? Uh, we did see quite a few culverts during our inspections that had seen some evolutions and had had started to trend towards more plain bed morphologies when we, we felt that maybe early on they were designed for a riffle pool. This, this will allow us to take a, a look at a time history of how these culverts are evolving as we get out and get those datas. And then the procedure wraps up with a visual assessment. So the visual assessment is, uh, is more qualitative and we propose this really as a way to add nuance to the data. The data is not always going to allow us to capture the essence of what's going on out there in the field. So via our work with the external technical committee, we identified five different themes that were felt by our experts to really be important to defining su success for an AOP passage structure. And these were uh, channel bed stability, flow condition continuity, how our width and depth can, you know, holding up through the structure, flow diversity, do we have multiple flow paths? Do we have multiple speeds uh, as we move through there for different fish at different life stages? Refuge opportunity, are there resting spots? You know, does, does the fish need to burst the whole way through the culvert or is, the is there opportunity for resting as it moves through? And then the last being sediment transport stability uh, with particular concerns towards aggradation, bar building inside the structures, um, aggradation at the at the upstream invert and how this may lead to, to ultimate blockage. So within this visual assessment, we have a number of scoring criteria that basically ask the inspectors to make a judgment call as they go through. Some of these rankings are absolute, some of them are comparative. Um, again, we, we like the comparative rankings because it's more it scales better as we move across the nation, as we move to different morphologies, different types of settings. As we use absolute rankings, we find it locks us in a little bit too much. So we tend to try to find comparative rankings when we could for these visual assessment metrics. So we started this project back in 2018, working with our technical committee, putting together the protocol. Last year, 2019, we went out and we started doing our field testing. We got out to 36 different sites across the country, started collecting our data for the stage one geomorphic assessment. Generally, we found that when a new inspection team would get out to the site, maybe the first one or two sites would take them about a half a day to get through. As they become 
more uh, familiar with what we were doing with the data collection, it sped up significantly. And we would find that the average site at that point would take about two hours. Um, generally, we would get two to three sites done during a day. The limiting factor really kind of turned into drive times between sites because there's they tend to be fairly spread out at this point in time where, where the AOP culverts are located. Types of systems that we encountered during the 2019 field inspections included several different types of design methodologies from the Forest Service stream simulation to HEC 26 to Washington State stream simulation. And we also started taking a look at retrofits. Uh, and I don't have a photo in here, but we did take a look at the uh, Vermont based bank full sizing metric, which is fairly similar to, to Charlie's. Uh, procedure in Maine. Um, we did get to a number of different morphology types though, from very low gradient, basic flowing wetland systems, up through some very steep gradient, high gradient streams, such as we had at that HEC 26 culvert in the bottom left-hand corner. So we've tested this against a pretty good wide variety of culverts. We're continuing forward. We're gonna be looking for, to, to increase that variety, both in setting and structure design type as we move forward. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Casey to talk about some of the lessons that we learned along the way in the 2019 tour. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, so just wanna reiterate the, uh, the great vision by Sven, Jim, and Steve at Western Federal Lands for this much needed uh, multidisciplinary project and also the great input from the external uh, technical committee and all the state DOTs that collaborated with us on the field inspections. and. With that said, um, during the course of the field inspections tours, the, the project development team and the inspectors that were originally not part of the development of the field forum were pretty instrumental um, in getting lessons learned and providing feedback for improving the forum. Um, many of, with that said, many of these lessons learned resulted in a modification to the field forum that Justin was uh, just explaining. Some of these things were as simple as just the order of inspection. Um, the original field form actually was kind of sporadically going through the site, through the project reach, and just something as simple as going through a sequential upstream to downstream manner of inspection was, uh, was one of the things that actually came out of the lessons learned, uh, just to be as efficient as possible with everyone's time when they're doing the inspections. Um, so this next three, these next set of slides are gonna really go over th um, three of the key lessons learned uh, that ultimately provides that context for the decisions that that uh, ended up in this final version of the form that Justin provided and also is included in your handouts um, as Justin mentioned. So the first one is uh, interior banks. So again, early uh, versions of the field form didn't include sufficient entries for fully cap uh, characterizing the, the channel banks through the structure. Um, the latest version of the form uh, introduced additional entries for characterizing the geometry stability and the material type of the interior banks. Um, on this slide, something to note, some of the state's regulations uh, require that the constructed banks uh, are comprised of a similar size and composition of material as the channel bed. And not too surprisingly, at these locations, the inspection teams noted that the interior banks, when they were constructed of these similar materials, um, often were washed out. So it's not too surprising. Um, and ultimately what this did is it typically resulted in a plain bed morphology through the structure. I will say with that, with this said, um, as noted on the, in the photo on the left there with that little, that little guy hanging out by a concrete stem wall, in some of the project locations where the interior banks were washed out, the, the project biologists also believe that uh, AOP still appeared to be effective um, in many of those locations where that was observed. Next, please. Other states' regulations um, did allow the placement of more larger rocks and boulders to promote bank stability and to really you know, look at enhancing the flow diversity through the structure. Uh, these are two structures located in Georgia and Vermont. And really at these locations, the stream uh, was observed uh, to less likely be entrained along the structural walls. Um, but also there was typically more diversity in the flow through the structure, which was believed to aid in the, uh, the passage for the, uh, the species of concern. Uh, next. 
As Justin uh, mentioned, this comparative assessment was actually kind of one of the key methodologies, one of the key methodologies that's utilized in Washington as far as stream simulation goes, but also was very important for this assessment. In the earlier versions of the field form that was developed, the, the data entries for the upstream and the downstream channel differed than those with that uh, was captured interior to the structure. And um, this really did not facilitate in a straightforward comparison of the upstream and channel upstream and downstream channel characteristics uh, with those that you would find in the structure. So based on the feedback that was gained through the uh, inspection teams, uh, the latest version of the field form uh, identifies uh, data entries such as channel geometry, bed material composition, roughness features, and some of the other ones that Justin just went over. Um, and they're the same data entries, both in the downstream, the upstream, and through the structure. And ultimately, that allows that direct comparison uh, of the assessment of those features along the stream being assessed. And also, as Justin mentioned, as the project continues, uh, a future phase of the project will include a more rigorous biological assessment. And so when those biological assessments are being conducted, um, you will still have that consistent and comparable geomorphic data to go along with the biological data to ultimately kind of bring everything together. Go ahead, Justin. Another topic um, that was consistent throughout the states we collaborated with was this discussion of what, what is the goal of the water crossing? Uh, was it for fish passage or aquatic organism passage? Was it for habitat? Was it for, or is it for both? Um, and this was not a consistent answer across the states that we uh, collaborated with. Matter of fact, some of the biologists in the study I, identified concerns with the potential uh, for increased predation on species of concern by actually creating attractive habitat inside the structure. Um, other conversations, you know, we debated uh, the goal of the water, what the goal of the water crossings are, and ultimately some folks were thinking it's, you know, to get the species of concern to tributary areas where there is more suitable habitat and not to create that habitat near the structure um, where the fish would be hanging out near the crossing or the roadway. And so that passage versus habitat topic is is a really good one i we think that it's going to continue it needs to continue um, through future phases of this project and just to bring everyone on the same page it it can definitely have a large impact on project goals um, and ultimately with that said it can ultimately have a, a, a impact on project cost and with that justin back to okay. you okay so just wrapping this up uh where we are today and where we're going with this so right now, uh, under our, our teams working on the, the next phase of this project, the paper form that we've uploaded to the module, we're actually in the process of program, programming that into a mobile application. I've got a separate IT team right now that's working on building a survey one, two, three based mobile form so that we can go out with tablets and with our cell phones and really fill this out in a more streamlined fashion. Also on the back end, we'll be looking to take that data out of the mobile application and dump it into a database. Right now, our database is gonna be fairly limited access amongst the project team, but there's the hope that over time, we'll, we'll be able to broaden the access to that and really have an open nationwide database that uh, future researchers can dive into and use the data we've been collected to help further, further our research goals on defining the effectiveness of, of the AOP crossings. We'll also be going out uh, you know, in, in the COVID world we live in. I, I think our field inspections are kicked back to next spring. We were hoping to get out this fall, but uh, at this point we're looking at next spring. But we'll be going out to Alaska because you know any good field work should really be done in Alaska, uh, as well as getting to, to California. We'll go visit Charlie in Maine, and then we're heading back to Washington because there are a lot of AOP culverts to look at in Washington right now. Um, I should mention that in the future, as additional funding becomes available, we would be looking for more and more partner states to work with, to deploy our method, to take a look at the structures there, add to the diversity of our data sets. So if you are a state DOT that is doing AOP structures and you would like to hear more about what we're doing, please reach out to anyone on the project team. We'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, also next year, we'll be putting together a web-based training module that's really gonna walk through the mobile application as well as many of the things we walked through today and work out procedures on how to do these measurements in the field and how to most effectively collect the data. 
And then as funding becomes available, as we continue to take more bites out of this pie and progress towards our final goal, uh, some additional steps we're looking at is the development of an interim scoring system. So it's gonna take a while to get all of the, the geomorphic data, to get all the biological data, to start to get definitive answers. But based on the data we're collecting, we do wanna start to put together an interim system because you know, as we're investing this money, as states are doing this on their own, we're gonna want some instant gratification on how well things are working. So we have proposed an interim scoring system. We'll look to vet that and deploy that in the future, as well as biological data collection and future steps. Uh, and then ultimately the, the nationwide launch of our database. And that is our presentation. So thank you for your time and your attention today. And I don't know if we have time for questions. I'll turn it over to Victoria. Yeah, thank, thank you, right. Justin and, and Casey. Appreciate that. Very good presentation. We do have two questions, and maybe we have time to get to them. Um, one of them was, have you come across wildlife bench designs for aquatic organism passage in box culverts? And if so, have they shown effectiveness in achieving aquatic organism passage between upstream and culvert and downstream reaches? Um. I mean, certainly box culverts are one of the tools in the tool chest when it comes to, to AOP design. We visited a few, um, let's say, I think we hit at least one, maybe two in Washington and a couple in Vermont. Um, the selection of a box culvert over an arched metal culvert doesn't seem to be a, uh, you know, a driving decision point between them. Um, I, we haven't seen anything in the box culverts that indicated any more problems than, than working with any of the other types of structures. I think just to add that too, if I understood about the wildlife bench, we, we definitely did see some of those. And I think that is, again, just that proper definition of what the goal of the project is. There's sometimes um, you know, a need or a want from the wildlife uh, biologists to have that bench being available and maintained over time. Um, but sometimes the fisheries folks want that material to be mobile. And that, that kind of gets in that uh, uh, bank discussion of, you know, again, coming up with that proper definition up front on, on what everybody wants and needs for a successful project. Thank you both for that. Um, the next question is, are the features that facilitate fish passage, i.e. large boulders, uh, to create low velocity pockets, are those the same ones creating uh, predator habitat? Um, possibly, you know, based on, you know, this is something that's come out of uh, conversations with Ted Castro Santos with the, the USGS, and he was telling us about a study they had where they had um, some nice large boulder structures in a stream that they thought was providing great habitat, great shelter area. And when they went back to visit it, what they found was that snapping turtles were resting on those rocks, waiting for fish to kind of shelter in the pools and then, and then grabbing them out of there. So uh, there certainly does seem to be some evidence that that's occurring at this point in time. I wouldn't say there's any definitive proof as to whether that's a a pro or a con. I mean, I mean obviously it, it can happen, but do the benefits outweigh the negatives? Uh, I don't think we have the data one way or the other at this point. All right, maybe to add, Justin. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say maybe to add that too is you know it, again it kind of comes up as part of that definition of the project goals. A lot of the um, designs and methodologies kind of revolve around the quote unquote stream simulation. And so if you're if you're mimicking the morphology in an adjacent reference reach, you know, where there's probably predators as well, and you're mimicking that within the structure, then um, you're likely to see similar types of uh, activity. Thank you, Casey. All right. Uh, with that, I think that's all we have time for. Appreciate that. Appreciate the presentation. Very informative. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you, gentlemen. So the next presentation <clears throat> will be the development and application of a hybrid approach to estimate bankful width. And presenting that will be Chao Hong. And Chao Hong is a is the excuse me lab manager of Genex Systems. 
which provides support service to FHWA's J. Sterling Jones Hydraulics Research Laboratory. Dr. Hong earned his Ph. degree from South China University of Technology in 2010. He specializes in the hydraulic performance research of highway infrastructures, including pavement, culvert, bridge, and coastal highways. He also has a broad range of knowledge and experience in research of bridge performances under extreme events. So with that, I'd like to welcome Chow with the uh, next presentation. Thank you, Chow. All right, thank you, Brad. Uh, I'm very happy to have this chance and share one of the research topics with you, uh, which we've already been working for two to three years for now. Um, so the topic is integration of riverbed, shear stress, and flow duration curves to determine the stream bandful width. Um, before we start, I would like to point out this is a team effort um, with Dr. Car Cornell Carney as the Hydraulic Research Program Manager of Federal Highway, and also my colleague, Dr. Chen Li, who is a research engineer in the lab. So um, just to echo Brad that uh, Cornell will hold a virtual tour for the lab tomorrow around new time. So if you've never been to the lab before, this would be a great opportunity to visit the lab over the internet. So um, this is a disclaimer for the presentation, the views and op op opinion, opinions uh, expressed in the presentation of uh, the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of Federal Highway and USDOTs. And this is a list of all the symbols that will appear in my presentation, uh, which I will explain in the later slides um, when we see those. So, um, I think thanks to Charles and, and Justin and Casey for the great presentations earlier. And I, I heard that we've already mentioned this uh, aquatic organism passage AOP issue a few times. And uh, this, in our research, I think this is the, we're trying to develop a method to, to see how we can predict the bamboo width. So this research actually starts with the statement uh, which is published by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in 2013 uh, as a water crossings design guidance. So it, it, said, it stated that the cover diameter or the box cover width should encompass 1.2 times the bamboo width plus two feet to ensure the cover size is a bit large enough um, for the for the stream flow. So in the question here is how we can determine a bamboo width. So this is a challenge question for some of the strain. So for, for some of the strain, it might be easy to do the physical measurement, just going out to the field and measure the, uh, the bamboo width based on the vegetation and the slope and all that. But for some of the other cases, sometimes it's really hard to determine the bamboo width by just uh, looking at the parents of that stream. The, the other question would be, what is the scientific basis behind this design criteria? Like why we are using the 1.2 times the painful width plus two feet as the design criterion for the cover diameter. So those are the questions we're looking into and in trying to develop an approach to predict the painful width. So uh, in a, in here, I hope everyone can see this animation. Um, we're trying to show this hydrograph uh, with the with the stream. As you know, that the hydrograph will have a varied discharge from time to time, and this is generating the hydrograph curves as we show in the lower oh, lower right of this animation. So. Once we have this hydrograph, what we can do is we can set up different intervals on the flow discharge uh, on the flow duration curve. And then if we go through each of the interval one by one, we can do the histogram and then we can see how much time we the stream ex experience for each of the level of that flow discharge. And then in the next slides, I'm going to convert this from the axis and the y, I mean, I'm going to swap the axis and the y axis. 
So it looked more like a regular histogram graph. So on the axis on the right figure, the axis shows the duration, uh, the, the discharge, and on the vertical axis it shows the duration, which means how much time the stream will experience for a certain level of discharge. So in the in the next slides, I'm going to show, okay, now we have all those different discharge levels. Um, we can actually run through the discharges through a computational um, fluid dynamics model, what we call the CFD model. And in those CFD model, you can output all the shear stress levels uh, based on different discharge levels. And then we will have the, we can do the average shear stress on the bed, and then we can come up with, um, with a curve for that. The next one I want to explain is how we can how we can turn the shear stress value into erosion rate, which means that this stream will deform according to this erosion rate. So this is actually, if you see those orange dots, those dots are actually obtained from one of our lab soil testing device, what we call the ex situ soil testing device, ESTD. So for each of the soil, we can run through different flow discharge in our device, and then we can do the measurement of the shear stress uh, directly. We have a direct shear stress sensor, which will give you the result of the shear stress. Meanwhile, we can also measure the erosion rate, which means how fast the soil will be eroded under that shear, under that shear stress by a laser scanner. So with those informations, we can collect those orange dots as the data point. Uh, the next step we are going to do is to try to do a curve fitting over those points. So on, on the figure, you can see there's a equation here, and this represents the soil erosion uh, resistance uh, properties of that single layer. So I want to point out here that the, one of the most important parameter we would derive from this uh, exercise is the critical shear stress tau C. Um, so this number, the, the key of this number is that any shear stress on the stream bed, if it's lower than the critical shear stress, it would not have any erosion. And if it goes above, then it will follow this yellow curve as the erosion rate grows. So in the next few series of slides, I want to show our approach uh, to see how we can determine the bandful width with this approach. So I'm going to show a few discharge levels uh, along this uh, flow duration curve. So as for the first discharge, it's a low flow rate, and we can see that the the shear stress tau one, uh, according to that discharge, would be less than the critical shear stress, which means there's a no erosion happen in this case. And then on the second case, um, our our shear stress on the bed is equals to the critical shear stress, which means that still there's no erosion happen in this case. But then starting from this case, uh, discharge Q3 we will have uh, erosion and the erosion volume here is actually a product of the flow duration time and also uh, the, and the erosion rate. So as you can see in this animation, this stream bed will deform because the tau, the, the mass shear stress tau three is larger than the critical shear stress. And then we are going to run through three more uh, discharges in this case. And you can see in this animation, the Q4 actually generates a greater erosion volume. Uh, the reason for that is it actually has a lesser time uh, duration compared to Q3, but actually has a higher erosion rate than the, than the uh, tau 3. So actually in the product, it actually generates a higher volume compared to the erosion volume caused by the discharge Q3. And this is another animation showing even in a, in a higher discharge level, 
um, this erosion volume is actually less because of the duration of that higher flow is actually lesser than the, uh, than the Q3 and Q4. And so on and so forth, we can run this exercise through all the histogram on, on the flow duration or the flow discharges, and you can see the erosion volume varies. So um, I just want to give a quick sum, uh, summary of what we described earlier. So in here, we show this same thing in a different way. So the E, the capital E here, represents the erosion volume uh, uh, in different discharge levels. And in the first level, we can see there's no erosion. And of course, in the second, in the second discharge, we also have no erosion here. Uh, in the third, we start to have some erosion volume. So this is an E3, and then moving forward, the E4, and then the E5. So now we can already see there's a trend showing uh, the peak of this uh, whole erosion volume curve is what we call a channel forming flow. And we are going to use that to determine our band flow depth and width in this case. So the associated discharge Q4 is what we call an effective discharge in this case. So this is the way we're trying to uh, derive the bandful width of the stream. So with that information, we can put this into a very similar like a rating curve for the stream. And this is actually showing the discharge versus the flow top width. And you can see there's a turning point at the baffle width because at that, after that point, we will go to a, uh, a floodplain. So in, in, in order to use this information, so now we have that information, how we can use it to come up with a more scientific basis for the cover design is uh, before we go, go through there, we need to convert this flow duration curve in the histogram format into a cumulative distribution format. So how we are going to do that is we take the duration number one uh, for the Q1 as this point, and then we have the second point as the, the sum of the duration of Q1 and duration of Q2, and then we can do this over and over again for the Q1 and the Q2 and the Q3. Uh, if we run through this entire spectrum of the discharge, we can come up with a curve. And this curve is what we call the cumulative distribution of discharge curves in our exercise. So now with that information on hand, we can try to incorporate this cumulative discharge curve with the flow top width curve. Um, the, the flow discharge and flow, flow, flow top width curve. So with this two curve combined, uh, what we can do is actually we can come up with a percentage of time while the flow top width exceeds the design width. So in here, I want to mention the design width is following the 1.2 times the bandful width plus two feet. So once we have that information on hand, we can determine we will have a percentage of the time, how, how, basically how much time the stream will be exceeding the top width of a certain value. So it's not only limited to the design value, but we can also use it for all kinds of other value. And then we, we use this percentage, or let's say it's an exceedance probability for the uh, cover design, because we assume that this number will be critical for some of the uh, fish species in the stream. So just to explain this concept a little bit further, um, I'm going to introduce one of the case study in our whole analysis. So this is actually a cover at State Road 307 crossing the Gamble Creek in Washington State. And um, so thanks for the Washington State for providing all those data to us. And this actually gives uh, this slide gives you an overview of the how the cover looks like in that stream. And we, of course, we can see that there's a multiple cross-sections in this stream. And we are actually just picking one of them as our exercise point here. 
So in this cross session, uh, the channel band bandwidth is about uh, 7.9 feet, and the D50 is around 0.5 inches, and the critical shear for that is about 10.8 Pascal. So this shows actually a profile of that cross session. And of course, uh, other than the this inform than the cross section information, we also need to collect the hydrograph information. So this is a hydrograph we collected based on the USGS data. And then on the right hand side, we can use this hydrograph to run, to run through a regression analysis based on the USGS equation. And then we can know what would be the Q2, Q10, Q25 all the way through Q500 for this uh, string. So in the next slides, uh, this actually shows an uh, animation of the uh, CFD models we ran through. So actually we ran different discharge through this cover, uh, through, through that cross section, and then we can see that the shear, what shear stress at the bat actually changes. Uh, from the uh, blueish color to now a little bit yellowish color, which means that this washer stress actually grows with the discharge. And then incorporate our methodology, as I stated earlier, we can use that to determine where the peak point is for the channel forming flow. And in this case, the the bandfoot depth of this cover of this cross section is about two feet. Uh, we can see there is apparently a peak on the erosion volume curve in this case. So if we plot this in the um, in the cross section that we got from the HECRAS model, it's, it looks like this. And then if we have this information, uh, we can incorporate this with the cumulated flow duration curve with the flow rate and flow top width relationship and then we can see okay now in this case the flow top width uh, the, the percentage of time of each flow top width ex ex exceeded uh, shows us the figure on the right so for this specific case uh, we can see that if we follow the design criterion of using 1.2 times the bandful width plus two feet as the design criteria, the actual exceedance probability of that width will be only 0.0005%. So this is a very, very low probability. I wanted to point out here that it's not the case for all the streams. Uh, in the later section, in the next few slides, you will see there is a actually a great variation for different types of uh, flow top width. So in, in here, uh, this is actually a comparison of our stream. Uh, if you look at the here, the, the CFD band for width or the band for width determined by our CFD is about 10.5 feet and the design width uh, would be 14.6 feet. That's based on the criterion of using 1.2 times the band for plus two feet. And then a uh, channel width of the Q2 would be around 11.5 feet. So this is a comparison on different uh, criterion if we use to determine the band width. And then we use the same approach, we apply it to different cases. Uh, so the majority of those cases are from Washington state, some of them from Iowa and other states. So this is a, a case study table, but Looking at this in a more graphic way, we will see that the on the left figure, it actually compares the bandful width. Uh, we measured it from the HECRAS model. Um, and here we, we, have, we don't have the luxury to go to the site and do the physical measurement. So we just simply measured it from the HECRAS model for that cross session. And then we compare it with the CFD bandful width prediction. And we can see that for some of the cases we had, we actually over predict the uh, bandful width. But it, the, the key here, I think we would like to point out is if you look at the figure on the right, this is actually the exceedance probability um, for 
for both the measured width and the CFD bamf width. So which means that uh, on the horizontal axis, it shows the exceedance of probability of the measure, the direct measure width being exceeded uh, as is the time percentage. So you can see already here, there's a great variation uh, from one minus one to the power of minus five to about 10% or so. And on the vertical axis, is it definitely showed the same trend in there. And then furthermore, we try we can try to plot another figure. So this is actually the exceedance probability if we follow the design approach based on the measure width uh, on the axis axis axis. And on the y axis, we are seeing that the design was based on the CFD band width. So again, you can see that it actually varies uh, even greater. Uh, it varies from one to the power of minus eight to almost um, almost ten percent in this case. So this is actually uh, gives us some thoughts about uh, how how can we improve our cover design. So to wrap up my presentation, uh, so this approach can provide a, a way of determining the bandful width whenever the direct measurement is not available. Also, I think it can provide the scientific basis for the for providing a time percentage while the flow top width exceeds a certain number. And hopefully we can use those information to provide a background for a more reasonable approach to determine the future COVID design. And uh, I, I also want to say that we do have quite some limitation of this current approach. For example, it requires quite some information from the site, such as the hydrology, also the geomorphic geom data uh, and the bad material and all those information. So, we need to use all this information to incorporate it into the approach to come up with a benefit with. But anyway, we hope our research can uh, shed some light for the future research as, as to come up with a better approach or more reasonable approach uh, for the cover, for the for the cover size design. Um, I think that's the end of my presentations. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Yes, Th thank you, Chow. Appreciate that, very good. Um, yes, we have two, three questions, excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. First one is, are the shear stress based on uniform flow, not slope of energy equation or gradually varied? Um, Yes, it's based on the uniform flow, but we actually ran a URAS model out of it. And then we would do the time average of the shear stress, both the time average and, and space average of the shear stress. But we could incorporate the slope and all other information in it. Um, depends on the need and what's the condition of that stream. Because the CFD is a very powerful tool, so we can provide all kinds of modeling capabilities. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are you assuming the next question is are you assuming constant material type across and how deep um yes so so in our case if you look at the uh the case we ran we actually just pick one of the cross section I'm going to show it here so it's actually going uh, we are doing this by cross session by cross session so for each of the cross session we assume uh uh constant material, uh, I mean, the, the material is not changing at that cross session. I think this is a reasonable uh, assumption. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah, I think it does. So are you assuming constant material type and how deep, I guess, was the next uh, two part? Oh, how deep? So in, in here, uh, I think we are assuming the constant material for the entire depth. We are just assuming the uniform uh, material uh, along the depth. And of course, this again, we actually we are actually developing a 
new erosion code. Uh, it's an effort from the hydraulics research program. We are cooperating with the Aragon National Lab. Um, so we actually, in that model, we could implement multiple soil layers and those information can also be taken into account. And that's, that's actually a very good question. Okay, thank you. Uh, does the CFD model hold up when D50 uh, gets big, like two inches? And how do you model larger rocks in the stream one foot in diameter? Mm -hmm. That that's a that's actually a very good question. So for now, yes, we just assume uh, a different roughness for the uh, for the stream bed material. So if we have some kind of material like rock. We may need to think about some other ways for the erosion mechanism. So uh, we we do I don't we, we do know that in the current HEC 18 we are using stream power for um, for the rock for the erodible rock. Uh, I mean in the new erosion code that could also be incorporated. So use that as an erosion mechanism rather than using the roughness. Um, so again, on the other on the other end, we can also use the CFD to simulate the the, the real geometry of the rock, which we have actually exercised before with the ribra analysis uh, with Aragon. So so that's also also a pot, potential way to simulate and come up with the result, a reasonable result. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. It appears the shear stress curve was developed from a fixed bed model. However, as shear stress increases beyond the critical shear stress for the material, the cross-section geometry has potential to change. Mm -hmm. Would this change in cross-section geometry change the hydraulics such that the shear stress curve would be different? Uh, that's, a, that's another very good question, actually. Uh, I would say Yes, it will change because we also invest some effort in that and on that end to start the scour decay function as well. Um, so in our model, we didn't consider that because we are just trying to use the traditional uh, the theory of the band channel forming flow to come up with a band for width. So in this version, we can consider that scour that shear stress decay in our model. Um, but I think in general, that's a very good concern. And I think we could, in, theoretically, we could implement that in our erosion code in the, in the next step. That's actually uh, another very good question. Mm -hmm. Agree. Was a comparison made, and the question, was a comparison made against the USGS bank full equation? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't compared that with the USGS bamboo width uh, equation, but that would be very interesting to see as a future effort. Another question is: How would this apply to the reconstruction of a bridge or culvert where the bankful width was not originally part of the design? Okay, so uh, very interesting question. So. I, I would say that uh, if we have all the information available, we could incorporate the model to, to build in the existing or the previous coffer uh, in the model. Since, since this CFD is really capable of dealing with all kinds of complex conditions, and I assume that we can consider that as well in, this, uh, in the model. So for now, this model doesn't include any existing uh, structures. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Okay. And thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. All thank right. you, everyone. That'll conclude session two of the hydraulics conference. Um, we hope to see everyone tomorrow morning on session three. Take care. <laughs>